afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. It's really great to see such a big turnout. Um, I'm just going to give a few words of introduction to Roth. Um, I first came across Roth, I think it was when I was actually lecturing on the MFC course back in about 2009. 2009. But before that, there was a kind of a, 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 a circuit, if you like, of um, groups meeting to discuss open access, open data, and open science, which was a kind of a new uh, buzzword at the time. Open access had been going for some while in terms of, sort of journal access, making content uh, widely available. There was a transition towards people making data more accessible. And there was this kind of new thing called open science, which is really about how we open up the scientific process and marry that with open data and open access. And Ross was one of those key individuals on that circuit, really promoting and hammering home why he thought that open science in general was such an important thing. And I would bump into Ross at a number of these meetings and we would interact. Ross then went on to do a PhD um, after the MSc course here. He did that on fossils and phylogeny at the University of Bath. And we've stayed in contact, again, through mainly bumping into meetings. And right now, he is a science, a scientific associate working in my group at the museum, focusing specifically on data mining. We have a huge problem in our field. We have generated an enormous amount of data and essentially stuck this in a myriad of PDFs and uh, repositories that are exceedingly difficult to access. And what Ross has been trying to do is dig deep into those PDFs and trying to reconnect up the references, the citations to our material in that body of literature and try to connect it back with the data that we have about our specimens. So he's particularly interested in this issue of data mining, content mining. He's been doing a huge amount of work. He's even managed to get our library blocked out of a few journals through this massive amount of data mining. Perhaps we'll hear about that today. Um, so. Uh, without further ado, let me hand over to Ross and I'm Thank I look you. forward to hearing about what you've been up to. There's uh, plenty of seats at the front if anyone wants to come. There's, there's lots of seats available. Um, I won't buy it, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to give a talk about my work on um, text mining literature, uh, looking for where our specimens are, me are mentioned in the research literature. And this is just, you know, it would be really boring if I just showed you a spreadsheet. So I'm going to kind of visualize things with this kind of graph layout structure where you've got blue nodes represent papers and the smaller balls represent specimens. Um, and that's me on Twitter. I do a lot of tweeting. If you do the tweeting thing, um, you can talk to me there anytime. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about the collections. You probably know a lot more about the collections than I do. I'm going to talk um, about the cost of accessing research, the hidden costs. Uh, I'm going to talk about content mining because I think it's really new and exciting and I think um, a lot of researchers should um, care about this and I'm going to talk about the actual you know, research I've been doing using these techniques. So as you probably all know we've got about 80 million specimens um, in the museum and you know they're super important for the world um, to know about and if you click on this is from a screenshot from the um, Natural History Museum website and if you click on this here it takes you through to our wonderful new data portal. And this data portal is absolutely fantastic and is, is very much one half of my research because um, it actually works really, really well. For those of you, I remember when I was doing my MSc, I got introduced to KEMU and I thought, wow, this is awful. Um, <laughs> this is absolutely terrible. And actually, this new data portal is fantastic. Absolutely brilliant to use. You know, you've got images, audio, interactive maps, citable records, API access, so you can, you know, scripted access to data. Absolutely fantastic. And so this is, you know, one half of my, of my research. Absolutely fantastic. And so this is going to be the basic gist of what I'm talking about. I'm introducing this early so you understand exactly what I'm doing in this research. I'm looking through uh, research papers, looking for all the times that specimen, um, particularly catalogue numbers, are mentioned. So they're BMNH 73, 76, 3, 15, 14. Notice they've got an extra period in between the BM and H and 76, which is unusual. Um, now, because the um, NHM Open Data Portal, you know, this specimen, rather than having that catalogue number, which isn't always unique, now has a completely unique identifier. And hopefully this will be stable as well for the next you know, 50 years, hopefully. 
And likewise, uh, most good literature um, has stable identifiers, DOIs. So if you can chain those two together, you can actually learn a, a whole lot more facts about each of those objects. Because you can dereference the DOI to discover the publisher, the authors, the year of publication, the date of publication, all that kind of stuff. And, and you can also you know, follow this and get a whole lot more information about this. 141 fields about this specimen. So even though it looks like there's just two pieces of information there, actually that represents probably about 200 pieces of information if you have those two, two pieces of information. So let's talk about scale. Um, a recent paper estimated that just available online, not even the stuff that hasn't been scanned in, but available online, there's 114 million papers online. And um, I went through the tables in this paper and about 36 million of those are in biology, environmental studies, geosciences or multidisciplinary, the kind of places where you might find museum specimens. Good plus one paper, very interesting. Trouble is though, the majority of those research papers, they're available online, but they're available online behind a paywall. And you can only access them if you're lucky enough or privileged enough to be at an institution that has access to those particular journals. And obviously, um, different institutions have different accesses to different journals, so no one actually can access everything. So it makes actually trying to do rigorous, systematic research on all literature incredibly hard. And for some further background on this, um, I found this data recently, so I thought you might like to know this. Um, Cheryl Hall, I don't know who she is, but fantastic, well done to her, put in an FOI request um, to find out exactly how much the Natural History Museum pays every year to rent journals from academic publishers, subscription access journals. And you can see the cost there that we were charged every single year to rent access to this subscription knowledge. And um, in the most recent um, data, because the FOI request was made in 2014, it was nearly half a million pounds. And on the other side here, I've got uh, one of the um, corporate academic publishing companies. And this is not even the entire company of uh, Reed Elsevier. This is just the scientific, technical and medicine division. Um, there are publicly traded companies, so you can examine their end of year financial reports. You can you know, look at these figures yourself and check them. Uh, and essentially, they make nearly a 40% profit margin every year because academics give their work to free for them, review for free for them, and then they sell it back to universities and institutions worldwide for huge profits. And frankly, they're just siphoning money out of research and charging a lot of money for it. So I think it's really important to remember that. But actually, it could be worse. I mean, we're lucky at the museum um, that we only need access to certain journals because um, obviously if, if you're a university and you cover a wide range of subjects, you need access to all these different kinds of journals, physics journals, humanities journal, journals, economics journals. So Cambridge pays nearly three million pounds a year. Uh, UCL pays over three million pounds a year. Manchester pays 3.2 million pounds a year to, to rent access to research for one year. That's not lifetime access, that's one year's uh, rental. Imperial College pays about 2.4 million pounds per year for their journals. And that uh, is all peer reviewed FOI data uh, <coughs> available at F1000 Research. So, I mean, I mention these facts not just because, you know, I'm a big open access advocate, but actually because it's relevant to this talk. Um, if we pay half a million pounds a year to rent access to all the, this research, why don't we actually use it? Why don't, instead of just looking at an article here or an article there, why don't we actually squeeze the lemon and actually get the juice out of this um, expensive resource that we're renting? And I, I can't read um, all the papers we have access to, but my computer can. Um, and, and computers, you know, you can read things, re documents really, really quickly. You can process a million documents, no problem, with regular expressions. So, uh, before we go into my work I've been doing, I'd like to talk about other people's work, uh, which I think is really interesting and really inspirational. Um, Paleo Deep Dive, PDD, uh, is a fantastic project um, in the States, and basically they've recreated um, Paleo DB, but by machines. Um, and they've done a really good job of it. So you can see here the red line is the human estimate of brachiopod body size estimates, and the grey bars are the same data, but entirely generated by machines reading the paleontological <coughs> literature, which I think is really, really impressive. Um, and it shows what you can do with computational technology these days. And I actually think it, it's actually much better than the PaleoDB approach, because um, at least with PDD, you have um, provenance data. You know exactly where they got the data from, because they link it back to the article they found the facts. The reason why they think this brachiopod is this big is because it said so in that paper. 
And if you look at data on PaleoDB, it's not so well referenced. There isn't the provenance paper trail there. Um, so I think that's a really promising approach. Um, this is what I was doing in my previous postdoc at the University of Bath called uh, the Pluto Project. Um, phylogenetic Literature Unlocking Tools is what Pluto stands for. And what we were doing is we were taking um, figure images, pixel-based figure images. There's no data in that. That's just pixels, right? Published in um, academic journals. Um, write some really clever computer vision software to actually interpret those lines, put it back into a tree structure to make the data, the phylogenetic data, usable again. And then come around here, and you can replot the data. So we've replotted the data here. It's missed out one of the taxa, strain 43, but everything, everything else is correct, essentially, just laid out in a different way. And you can reanalyze that, and you can also combine together you know, lots of them to make a bacterial super tree. Now, obviously, bacteria are probably more a ring of life rather than a tree of life. But um, that's what we're working on at the moment on that project. And, and that's really, really exciting. That shows what you can do with images from the literature. So it's not just text mining. It's actually you know, audio mining, image mining, and text mining. That's why, that's why I prefer to call it content mining rather than just text mining, because it's uh, multimedia. So if, if you want, if you desire, if you have thirst for, to, to get thousands of articles on, on your computer, how do you do this? How do you go about downloading 10,000, 100,000 articles? Uh, well, I'm, I'm working with a group called Content Mine, uh, led by Peter Murray Rust. He's got a Shuttleworth Foundation um, funded project to do this. And basically, we're holding workshops and creating software tools to help researchers actually download papers en masse. And two of our best tools at the moment are Get Papers and Quickscrape. And they're all open source, free to use, available on GitHub. Um, so you can try those out afterwards if you want to, if you're interested. I'm going to demo one of them here. So I'm going to pause this video halfway through to explain what I'm doing. Um, this is a YouTube video. So this is me in my command line. Let's press play. OK, so ls shows you there's nothing in the folder, right? It's listing the files there. There's nothing there, just to show you I'm not cheating. There's no magic going on here. So now I run the command. And I'll stop it when it's done. There you go. So I'm just pausing the video again. What I did there um, is I ran get papers, query, the journal e eLife, first publication date, um, 1st of January 2013 to the 6th of the 1st, 2013. So get me all the, all the publications in the journal eLife in XML format and put it in a, in an, uh, in a folder called eLife. And so what it's done there, it's downloaded 100 papers in about four seconds which I think is really, really cool. I mean, if you think, if you did that with a mouse clicking around the website, can you imagine how long that would take? One, two, three, it's really, really slow. Um, but more impressively, perhaps, is what I'm gonna do next. On the next query, the next query I'll just leave running. Um, I'm getting everything from eLife, but instead I'm getting it in PDF, XML, and the supplementary data, if there are supplementary data files. And I'll just wait while it runs. Um, this is using the Europe PubMed Central <laughs> API. Um, so we really need to thank Europe PubMed Central for helping us do this. Um, and I think this will definitely be you know, an important part of the future. Instead of using Web of Science or Scopus or something like this, I think you know, command line searching for research is possible. There's lots of other parameters you can use. You don't have to specify journal. You could just put, um, specify um, the thing you're interested in, like um, cytochrome oxidase, let's say. And so that took about 35 seconds. And as you can see, it's downloaded PDFs, XML, supplementary files for 100 different papers in about 35 seconds, um, which shows you, you know, that you can really get access to re research very, very quickly, very, very easily. And we've built, built these tools, and they're freely available, and you can go and use them now. Ah, oh, let's see if I can go on the next slide. Ooh, I just want to play this a little bit. seem to have lost full screen. Well, it's okay. We'll, we'll carry on like this. Um, so um, if you want more than just a few thousand uh, <coughs> files, particularly from PubMed Central, it's probably easier just to download the whole stack, everything that PubMed Central has. So PubMed Central actually facilitates this for its open access content, but only for its open access content. So they have this thing called the Pub PubMed Central Open Access Subset, 
which you can download 1.1 million articles, uh, which is a fantastic achievement in XML format. And it's only 16 gigabytes, so it's very, very portable. Um, but unfortunately, you know, the amount of open access content is actually quite small relative to the whole. Um, so it is only a subset of what's out there. Obviously, you know, you'll get all of PLOS One in that, all 100,000 PLOS papers in PLOS One, but it's a really good um, test corpus to try things against. And um, so yeah, this is what I started with. I, I said, hey, well, if, I, if this is actually gonna work and worthwhile trying this, doing text mining for <coughs> specimens, I should probably try the PubMed Central Open Access subset. And so that's what I did. And obviously, you know, 95% of the articles is absolutely nothing relevant to the museum in them. Um, but that's not a problem because, you know, the computer just skips that in a microsecond. Um, but there is, you know, journals like Plus One, uh, BMC Evolution Microbiology, PAJ, and some Zuki's articles in there. Um, don't know quite why there's so many Zuki's articles in there, but there are. Um, and so you get some interesting results from the PubMed Central Open Access subset. And I, I should just highlight, you know, this isn't work that's completed at the moment. This is work that's very much ongoing. Um, all the data is um, live on GitHub right now. I pushed some data just today to GitHub. It's one big spreadsheet, essentially. Um, I've got about um, 6,500 um, specimen paper pairs at the moment. Um, so yeah, it's ongoing. But I quickly realized that by downloading full texts, I wasn't actually finding everything I needed. And here's an example um, in PLOS One. Let me try and get rid of this bar. Come on. Okay, we're gonna have to carry on. Um, this is an example from PLOS One paper. Unfortunately, um, nowadays where we have these supplementary data files, um, a lot of authors, and I think journals are encouraging authors, to put the most interesting data in supplementary data files. And so by analyzing the full text, I'm not actually seeing the specimens that were used. And, and that's a huge problem, because actually no one actually indexes um, supplementary data files. If you want to search across supplementary data files, you can't, basically, unless you download them all yourself. Um, Google Scholar doesn't do it, Web of Science doesn't do it, Scopus doesn't do it. Um, and I, I think that's a huge problem, and I'll, I'll get back to that problem later. Here's another thing you do. Um, I'm, I'm not just actually finding these specimens um, in the paper and marking up the text and recording that. I'm actually going one further. I'm actually looking them up in the NHM Open Data Portal to see if I can associate the catalogue number with um, an NHM Data Portal record, because that's a whole lot more valuable because then you can gain you know, 141 more fields of information about that specimen. Um, and when you do that, it's quite interesting. E even for a paper where all the specimens are really well covered, um, actually 10 out of 34 of these specimens in this paper are for some reason not on the data portal. So there are obviously some um, digitization issues and something I'd be really keen to talk um, with curators about and if anyone has any idea you know, why there are so many specimens still not on the portal yet. Um, Um, very few specimens occur in more than one paper. Um, here's an example of one. You probably know what it is. Uh, BMNH37001 is, of course, the uh, BM Archaeopteryx. And that occurs in about you know, four different PLOS One papers I've found so far, two different nature papers. And this is just in the full text, remember. Obviously, um, I, I, I can't see it if it's in the supplementary data files at the moment. So um, it's an incomplete study at the moment. Oh, I really need to get this full screen. Anyway, um, so I got bored of uh, the PMC open access subset and I decided I want to go bigger. I want to search uh, more relevant journals and I want to get uh, bigger data, better data. So I thought rather than searching what I can search, let's search what I want to search. <coughs> so I've downloaded about 15 years worth of nature, science, PNAS, phytotaxa, zootaxa, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, over 200 journals. And not even just um, subscription access journals, but some open access journals too, like the Cielo journals um, from South America. Excellent open access journals, but the trouble is they're not included in PMC, so you still have to download them one by one. Um, they're not aggregated anywhere. And so again, it's you know squeezing the lemon, getting more data from the literature, and doing a bit of journalomics. And is this legal? Well, actually it is. In, in the UK, this is legal now um, because of a recent um, change in copyright law. Um, it's only legal if you're doing it for non-commercial purposes, so I can't sell the results that I'm doing here, unfortunately. 
Um, but it, it is legal, to, as long as you have access to the resource, as long as the museum has a paid subscription to say the Elsevier journal I'm looking at or the Cambridge University Press journal I'm looking at, it is legal to, down, to, do, to do this. Um, I can't actually give the entire journal to someone else, but I can um, download it myself for mining purposes. So yeah, seriously, I've done this. Um, so something you should know, yeah, the right to read is the right to mine in the UK. Um, uh, other countries in the world don't have this. Um, France, Germany, the Netherlands, uh, most of Europe, you can't do this. <laughs> if you do this, you'll get put in jail like Aaron Swartz was. Um, and it could be potentially very serious. Um, so I, I, I'm really thankful that the UK government has modernised copyright law. So, for some results. <coughs> uh, again, um, talking about the supplementary data issue, of course, because nature and science articles are so incredibly condensed and all the data is actually packed away in the supplementary materials file. Um, so even though you know, I looked at 15 years worth of nature, I could only find about 25 specimens in the full text because all, all that information presumably is packed away in supplementary data files. And in science, I only found um, 11 specimens mentioned in the full text. Um, but obviously there are more out there. I'm just going to have to go and do another trawl now for supplementary data files. I should say I've only been doing this for about four or five months now. And most of that time uh, was actually spent actually just downloading the, the journals. And so I, I, in general, I think this is a really bad idea. Um, I think here's an example of a nature paper. It's a really good nature paper. The science is fantastic. But my problem with it is in the paper version, it's seven pages. In the PDF version, it's 12 pages. They've added some nice pretty figures and a, a couple of small tables. But the supplementary data file reads like five papers concatenated. Um, it's got like seven different sections to it, each with separate authors. And, and there are in, entire papers in there, basically. It's 249 pages in the supplementary data file. And I think that's really remarkable. And I think journals like Nature, Science, Biology Letters um, do this quite a lot. And I think it's really problematic for people like me trying to do text mining, trying to discover what, scientists, what data scientists have used. It's very, very problematic. If you take a data-centric view of the research literature, you're not actually learning anything about the data they used in the paper by reading the paper, um, which is very, very odd. So someone needs to build a searchable index of supplementary data, ASAP. Uh, it's not going to be me. Um, it needs you know, significant infrastructural support to do that. Figshare don't do this. Dryad doesn't do this. Zenodo doesn't do this. Um, they accept data if people are willing to give them data. No one has a global index of journal supplementary data. So to show you some real data of what I've been doing, um, this is a um, number of papers with NHM specimens in them uh, by year of publication. We've got a really interesting artifact here. Um, I have no idea why there's such a jump in 2012 of papers. Obviously, in each paper, there can be multiple specimens. So you can get you know, like 10 or 20 or 50 specimens in one paper. But this is just um, counting by papers. And you can see my sampling wasn't very good for a couple of journals I accidentally downloaded too far. Even though I said I was only going to do 2000 for 2015, I actually downloaded a few early, earlier papers as well. Um, but yeah, that's some of the data I've got so far. I would love to click on the link down here, but I can't because it's not available, so I'll just move on. So going back to here, uh, back to the original example, um, it's more than just linking what I'm doing here. Actually, you can do much more than linking. And I think we can actually do some knowledge repatriation <coughs> of actually getting some knowledge about specimens back to the museum um, beyond just the linking. Because this particular paper of the, the, the text snippet I've highlight, highlighted there, that actually came from a figure caption. And if you actually look at the figure, it's got some really nice CT scan um, imaging. And and actually, that image is not on the Open Data Portal. There are images of this specimen on the Open Data Portal, I'll show you. Um, but, but not this particular CT scan. See, here's the record on the Open Data Portal, and you've got three lovely images of the specimen. But um, if, if you just went here to the Open Data Portal, you wouldn't know that it's been CT scanned. And so the great thing about you know, publishing in PLOS One, why I'm wearing the PLOS T-shirt today, is that because it's openly licensed, you can copy that put it on the open data portal, and that's fine because it's open data. Um, and, and you can do that, and I think that's a really good idea. We can actually repatriate knowledge back to the museum. 
Um, and here's another example. Um, by chance, I found <coughs> this specimen in, in an ichthyological journal, uh, BMNH 2013 to 13.3. And in the paper, you know, it's a new species, it's a paratype of a new species, and, and the species is called um, Hori. And, and yet when you go on the NHM data portal, it's just Petrochromis novs for Takahashi. And it's, it's not an NHM researcher, it's a, it's a visiting researcher from Japan. So I can kind of understand why that knowledge hasn't made it back to the collection yet. But I'd, I'd really like to know if we can create some processes to actually take data from the literature and put it back into the catalogue um, to actually you know, complete that circle of information. I think that could be really, really useful. So um, I hope I haven't taken up your time too much. And sorry about the issues with the slides. Um, I've got sincere thanks to the NHM library for actually supporting my work doing this because I know several publishers have rung up the library and emailed them saying, do you know someone's been downloading 10,000 PDFs on this IP address? And we've looked at this computer and it's called Ross. Do you know who it is? Are they, are they hiding their computer in a closet somewhere? It's like, no, my computer is on my desk and it's legal. So, you know, we're paying for this. So. I can do it. And, you know, thanks to Nancy Chillingsworth um, for the um, intellectual property advice, uh, Mark Wilkinson, Peter murray Russ and the Content Mind team. I can show you more of their tools later if you're interested. Please do email me about that. Uh, Vince for hosting me in his lab. Ben Scott for the fantastic data portal. It really is a breath of fresh air. And Rod Page for some advice on this kind of stuff because he's also doing this very much with um, um, BHL and Biostore. So, yeah, thank you. Any questions? Any questions? That's definitely what I'd like to do next. I'd like to download all the GenBank XML, look for specimen numbers in that, and tie up GenBank sequences with um, the Open Data Portal specimen records. That would be really cool. I think I've done that for that fish, actually. That, that particular fish here also has GenBank sequence data. So you can um, tie back not just you know, its actual name now, but also the GenBank <laughs> sequence data. But even, even then, even if it is in the GenBank record, I mean, we don't know about it here at the museum necessarily. So it'd be nice on, on the actual specimen record. I mean, if I go to the specimen page here, there's nothing about GenBank and there's nothing about where it's been published on. And I think, you know, I've, I've already got 6,500 records now. It'd be nice to add those as an extra column on the portal somewhere so you can actually find, you know, where this specimen has been cited in the literature. But then also, you know, a column, as you say, of, um, you know, DNA sequence data from this, this specimen would be great as well. Yeah. And something we can do, it's very, very doable. GenBank, there's no, there's no legal issues with GenBank. You, um, anyone in the world can download data from GenBank. It's only the publishers that make it difficult to download stuff from them. Just, yep. just as a comment on that, so I mean, with respect to the data portal, one of the ambitions as to where all this is going is very much to try and include the structured in I was going to try and bring this up in the talk, actually. This is another graph of, instead of um, by publication year, this is by journal, uh, just for the Bio 1 journals, 131 Bio, Bio 1 journals and um, Springer journals. And there's some really interesting patterns within this. Um, particular communities, like the parasitological community, are really good at mentioning um, spe specimen um, catalogue numbers. 
and so I'm getting a lot of parasitological um, specimens come up in my searches. Um, PLOS One appears big, but when you consider the amount of um, actual papers in PLOS One, that's actually really tiny on a relative scale. And then, you know, the ichthyological journals are also very good, um, copia and ichthyological research. Yeah, I, I heard about it. I saw talks about it, and um, I have no idea. Um, sounds yeah. like a good idea. Like most of these things, the scaling is cheap, and I think they run into the kind of the scaling rule in terms of how they do the um, instruments that have scales across the. So it was a technical issue. It wasn't a, uh, it's a cultural it's issue that made it. it. I mean, I think there are cultural issues as part of that, but fundamentally, in there, it was a, a, a technical issue. It's a little over. Yeah. And um, I think that there is something to be said for um, campaigning to have editorial uh, uh, encouragement or requirement, maybe, yeah. of um, including including the, the information. Because I can see that even if, if you put in those identifiers, um, that's a lot of, if, if it's in print, that's going to be the kind of thing that they're going to cut if they yeah. uh, want to. definitely with the publication by year I think as I get more data I think we'll see that issue of you know the the whole print thing um, dissuading people from putting all the specimens they've used in the paper I think that will come out in the data definitely um, I think uh, you can also um, discover some really interesting things from this data of um, exactly how they mentioned the specimen did they say BMNH or did they say NHM UK um, in some journals, it seems like there's complete variance even within the same journal in the same year. And, and again, that's you know perhaps lack of editorial control, a lack of a style guide. Yeah. So is there any um, uh, proactive work on the part of the museum in doing this? It seems like exactly the kind of thing that should be done by our yeah. museum or SciCall or somebody who's speaking on behalf of collections and uh, publishers. I think there's something called GR Bio. Um, and they're trying to standardize how you actually cite um, re uh, biodiversity repositories, you know, museums and stuff, um, actually standardizing the citation identifiers. So that's good work, um, GR Bio. But yeah, there's a lot of work to be done, basically. So I'm wondering if you should just focus on adults' mm. specimens, which have been standardized. Uh -huh. Yeah, I've got to say there's a huge bias in my data collector so far, almost nothing botanical. Um, because of the types of identifier I'm searching for, mainly focused on NHM UK, BMNH, NHM, something like that, um, the way um, they cite specimens in botany is completely different, and I'm not really searching for that yet, but I could develop techniques to search for that perhaps. Well, there's a big argument going on. I mean, it's interesting that the Archaeological Society is sponsored this with GR Bio, because, because there's a big argument going on about exactly So I really like um, <laughs> Curie's as a way of doing this. And this comes from outside the biodiversity space. Um, I really like this way of doing it because I think it makes a lot of space and it's actually good for keeping it compact. Curie stand for compact URIs and they look like that basically. So you've got GenBank, colon, and then the GenBank number. Uh, if, if we could do something like that for museum specimens, I think that would really, really work because um, it's obvious that that is some kind of identifier, right?
So the enormous heterogeneity of uh, specimen identifiers that we have used, um, even within the same department at, at the same time. So it's, it's that inconsistency that makes life very, very difficult. And of course, it's an order of several orders of magnitude greater when you start to run across an ensemble of single humans. Yeah. I've also <laughs> discovered a lot of um, funny things like this, where you can see they've, they've meant to put in the specimen number. Um, <laughs> And by the time it's published, and it's still in the published paper, you know, there's no correction or anything here, but, you know, it's a small thing. Um, but you can see quite a few of these I've found. It's, it's quite funny. So no one really reads taxonomic papers, I guess. So, so Rob, what would be the, if there was one piece of advice to us that you would give in terms of yeah. trying to make this, improve the connection between our literature and the specimens that we find, what would that be? Would it be sort of consistency of identifier linking to the portal? Uh, I would say uh, publishing with Pensoft is the best piece of advice. Uh, Pen Pensoft, I'm working closely with Pensoft on a new journal called RIO, uh, Research Ideas and Objects, uh, going to be the first journal ever to publish research proposals, um, wants to publish the entire research cycle. But um, Pensoft are really interested in my work, and they're actually going to, as part of their publishing platform, actually try and mark up institutions and specimen codes when they publish things, because they do a lot of markup already. So they're just adding it to their long list of things they mark up. So if you publish with Pensoft, you know, you're getting you know, real 21st century, 22nd century publishing there. Whereas if you publish with something like um, Zootaxa or Phytotaxa, you're getting 20th century publishing, and it really doesn't help. Um, one of the major challenges I have with this um, text mining project is for journals that are PDF only, like Zootaxa and Phytotaxa, um, page breaks and line breaks are horrendously annoying. If you've got BM and H there, and then the actual identifier cuts off the other side, and I don't always have robust techniques to deal with that. And if, it, if it's HTML, you can reflow it, or if you've got XML, that's not a problem. But if it's PDF only, that actually is very, very problematic. So please don't publish in journals that are PDF only. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. And I, I just didn't understand what you were saying that was done. So I understood it was scanned for pixels and then somehow combined with a bunch of other phylogenetic trees that were also pixels and turned into a new tree. Yep. So essentially you erased all the data that went into that all the time, turned it into a graph, uh, uh. I don't know, shadowing process. I, I don't. I So yeah, there, there was a lot of um, stuff going on in the slide, I apologize. Um, this, this was my previous postdoc, basically, and I spent, you know, 90% of the postdoc actually was working on this bit, um, which is my work. Um, and basically, I mean, you can't really see because, you know, this is a presentation slide, but this image was a bigger image than the page break. Right. And so instead of being able to copy and paste that, and you know, put that into PowerPoint, or put that into CMP, or put that into RAP, no, you can't, because it's just a JPEG. And so what we've done is you can use computers to analyze that picture and get this branch extractor structure back, but not, not just the branch extractor, but also the branch length, which we can encode in either uh, MUIC or NetML format, which is standard interchange format for phylogenetic data. And then, so what we can do in the second stage here is we can actually replot the data in a different way. You can um, map some of your own data onto the phylogeny. You can you know, prune out some tips or if you have you know, thousands of images, as we were doing, because we, we analyzed like an entire journal, we, we downloaded like 5,000 papers to do this. Um, at the end, we ended up with like 924 source trees with good valid data. And so we could combine those to make a super tree, an MRP, a simple MRP super tree. Um, and I know, you know bacteria aren't, aren't a perfectly bifurcating tree. They're a ring of life more than um, a tree of life. but. Is, is it as a proof of concept for information extra extraction, I think it's quite an interesting project. Does, well, that, does that answer your question? A little bit. So, um, I, I, think my, I think my, my concern was now 
Well, basically, if you think about it, we spend enormous amounts of time in huge amounts of highly structured data, but then we stick into highly unstructured formats like images, like what Russ is talking about here, and PDF documents. And frankly, that's crazy because most things that have to be reverse engineered to actually do anything um, uh, computationally with that information. So think, for example, a journal like NTD, Molecular Biogenetic Review, it's like a telephone But they're all pictures. So if you wanted to say, give me a fig tree of that, you couldn't do it. You'd have to apply some kind of, you'd have to retrospectively read that tree, read those branch lengths, and then get that in a machine readable form to do anything with that. And that's kind of bonkers, because it all started off as a new file that yeah. someone was busy analyzing in Calc or Beast or whatever to, um, to, to generate that data in the first place. So it's this general point, which is the broader point, I've got a three-word answer for that. It's uh, biodiversity data journal. Uh, still free. Still free. <laughs> and still Pensoft. Because I have a slight bit of interest in But yes, yeah. I mean, so um, DDJ is specifically designed for um, uh, data-oriented publication. So if you want to publish something, a, a rich story about something, then probably DDJ is not the best place. And I think fundamentally it comes back to, as an organization, you know, what do we want to invest in? You want to spend, as Ross pointed out, what was the figure? Half a million, Half a million per year every year, million. increasing every year. I find that figure staggering. But if our library is spending half a million on journal subscriptions, we're only publishing, what are we publishing? We're publishing about 700 articles a year. So we could turn some of that around at least into open access publishing and actually then um, uh, relatively soon. We're already at a kind of tipping point whereby more stuff is open access. Relatively soon, we will be at the point where actually it doesn't, you know, we won't have to keep paying that, those extortionate subscriptions and keeping the likes of uh, Elsevier and in uh, volume there. <laughs> okay, I think that's probably, if there are no more questions, that's probably a good point to wrap up.